Hey, everybody. So, uh, sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties here. So, all right, we should be fine. Let's get back here. Um, we're talking about the braking system subcategories or subsystems, and we were about to get into the apply system. So the apply system is going to be obviously where the driver is going to apply the brakes. Now, there's something here that is important to note. On the left side, we have a brake pedal, and on the right side, we've got, um, it shows the brake pedal as well, but it also shows a parking brake um, release handle. So I'm going to stop share here and we're going to talk for a moment on this. So there's two terms I need you to remember. We want to know the term service, brake, and parking brake. Brake, brake, doesn't matter. Um, the important thing to note is that all vehicles are going to have uh, their brake system separated into two main subcategories, essentially, and that is service brake and parking brake. Your service brakes are what applies when you press on the brake pedal. Your service brakes are going to be hydraulic in nature, meaning they use fluid and fluid pressure. Um, to transfer movement and force. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more specifically on that in a few, but um, service brakes utilize hydraulic force because hydraulic advantage is, or there's something called hydraulic advantage that allows us to use different sized pistons. And if you're thinking like an engine piston, it's kind of sort of similar. It's a plug in a hole um, inside of different sized cylinders to increase uh, our force applied. So uh, if you look at where our braking system starts with the applied, the master cylinder, the size of the piston and cylinder, your master cylinder is not very big, but your brake caliper cylinder is actually really large and that's how we're going to multiply the force. Similar to um, what you can think of as far as hydraulic advantage goes is you can think of jacks. Um, normally you could never lift a 3,000 pound vehicle on your own, right? but you can very easily utilizing a jack. Well, how do you do that with jack? You do that through hydraulic advantage and utilizing different size pistons on an input and output. So that is uh, our service brakes. Parking brakes, and, and these have two different functions. So your service brakes are for uh, slowing the vehicle and keeping it stationary, say it like a red light, right? Your parking brake, also known, a lot of people call it an e-brake or an emergency brake. We don't really want to use that term because it's not technically what it's used for. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a secondary brake that can be used as a potential emergency brake, but it is mainly designed for parking, meaning you were already stopped, you parked, and you applied this brake. The parking brake is not hydraulic in nature, and here's why. If you're parked on a hill, and you spring, one of the downfalls of hydraulic systems is if it leaks, you lose pressure. You lose pressure, you lose force applied. And so if I lose my force applied, and let's say it's a stick shift vehicle and you left it in neutral, and you were relying on that parking brake to keep you stopped, and that parking brake fluid pressure leaked, and, and now you have no parking brake, and it goes down a hill and kills somebody or runs into a house or another car, um, it essentially turns itself into like a bowling ball, right? Just rolls until it hits something. That is a problem. So we never, ever, in fact, there's a rule for FMBSS kind of stating that it, it, you really can't use hydraulic systems for parking brake for that reason from an OEM standpoint. So for those of you who are thinking, but wait a minute, I've seen that in drifting. Yes, there are aftermarket setups that allow you to do hydraulic parking brakes but it is for a specific application. You're never going to see that from the OEM. Your parking brake, so we don't run into that issue, always needs to be mechanical in nature. Um, and in a lot of newer systems, we're looking at electromechanical type setups where um, the actual parking brake 
action is still mechanical, but what actuates that action, so rather than pulling a lever um, that pulls a cable that will apply your parking brake, instead you press an, uh, you press a button and it actuates an electric motor that mechanically applies the parking brake. Regardless, there's going to be a mechanical aspect, um, whether the application is mechanical or electro in nature, that'll depend on the year making model of the vehicle. We are seeing a lot more electromechanical parking brakes. Um, but I'll talk more about, I'll, I'll, we have a whole semester to discuss this when we get into uh, breaks next semester. So um, we will dig a lot deeper into this, but I think it's really important um, fundamental knowledge to know the difference between service brakes and parking brakes um, and what applies them um, and how. So let's go back to our screen share. Now that we know that, um, let's talk more about the apply system. The apply system on the left here, we've got a pedal that's going to have a fulcrum. Um, we're going to get way more in depth in this in a brakes class and the, how the length of the pedal affects everything and all that. Um, but if you see here, this is simply a pivot point, a fulcrum. Well, right here we've got something called a push rod that's going to, right here we're not showing any power brakes. So if you're thinking there might be something missing, there is, but we're just trying to look at the fundamental portion of this. This push rod is going to apply that master cylinder I keep talking about. So there's going to be um, an action in here that's going to apply hydraulic pressure. We'll talk about that in a few slides. On the right here, obviously we've got the brake pedal. It's gonna do the same thing over here, but right here we've got a release handle. So there's a few different ways that your parking brake can be applied. Um, your parking brake can be applied via um, a center console handbrake lever, right? So it's got the button, so you pull up and you hear it click, and you pull up further, push the button in to, um, and, and pull it down, pull it, push it down to uh, disengage your parking brake, right? Another one would be there is a secondary pedal on the left, um, so you've got your brake, uh, or I'm sorry, your gas, your brake, and then if you've got a clutch pedal there, and all the way on the left, an additional pedal may be there for a parking brake. Chevy, for lots of manufacturers, use this design. So sometimes um, uh, on a lot of Fords, and, and this sort of goes back and forth. So, um, but on a lot of vehicles, they would press the but, uh, the pedal down to actuate your parking brake, and then you'd have to press on the pedal again and let up, and the pedal would spring back to disengage your parking brake. Other designs Chevy uses for the Tahoe um, and many other. Uh, vehicles that they made um, where you press down on the pedal to actuate the parking brake and then you would pull a release handle um, in order to release the parking brake. Now in this design right here, Toyota used this design for a while, um, especially in their trucks, where they have this long lever underneath the dash and you can see there's a linkage here, um, where you would pull this sort of T-handle out and it would lock. When you wanted to disengage the parking brake, you would have to pull it further, twist it, and push it back under the dash to disengage your parking brake. So those are three mechanical applications. Uh, the new design, which is what most manufacturers have pretty much all gone to um, in most of the vehicles now, are, is like an electromechanical design. So you simply press a button, that is your parking brake button, and you'll hear a little e in the back. There's an electric motor. It's When you press the button, it's simply telling a computer, hey, I would like to engage my parking brake. The computer then sends a current and voltage to an electric motor at the back parking brake, and it will engage mechanically the parking brake back there. So those would be all the ways that you would apply your brakes, whether they be service brakes or parking brakes. The next system is going to be our boost system and there's actually a third boost on here that I don't have a picture of because it's super new and it's very hard to get pictures of um, but it's a little bit more of an electronic boost system which I think most vehicles will go to eventually. So on the left and this is an x-ray sort of picture here so I think I've got a better picture um, hopefully in the next slide. On the left here we've got a vacuum booster. So for a moment here, I want you to take a look. This is our master cylinder internally. I've got two pistons inside. Uh, these are where we keep, uh, this is where we keep our fluid. Now in between 
So this is the push rod I was talking about with your applied system. So you press down on the pedal, you press down on the um, push rod, which will engage the master cylinder. Well, in between here, we have what we call a vacuum booster that has two different, um, uh, two different sections inside of it. And there is a rubber diaphragm in here that moves. One side is going to be vacuum, the other, or, or one side is going to be variable, the other side is going to be vacuum. So essentially what it's utilizing is air pressure in one side or the other, or lack thereof, in order to move a valve inside here to help push that push rod to assist us. So if I have a vacuum, let's say, in this area here, an atmospheric pressure in this area here, then this atmospheric pressure is going to push this direction, which is going to help push our push rod. So that's sort of how vacuum boosters work. They require engine vacuum in order to work. A couple of downfalls, um, obviously they're big and bulky, like the big black drum that is usually just sort of out in, in, in the way of things and, and, and is sort of bulky. Lots of people like to eliminate this when they're building hot rods or mini trucks or any type of custom type vehicle where you're concerned with the underhood look of the vehicle. Um, vacuum boosters are not uh, very attractive to most. Then on the right, we have something called a HydroBoost system. The HydroBoost system, essentially, in a nutshell, it is utilizing power steering pressure in order to apply or help apply your brakes. Mind you, neither of these are going to apply your brakes without your assistance. They require you to at least apply some brake while they assist you. Um, lots of diesels are known for utilizing a power, or I'm sorry, a hydro boost system. This is because they don't have vacuum. Diesels don't have a throttle plate, which means they can't have vacuum in their intake manifold, which means if I don't have vacuum, I either have to do one of two things. I either need to do a hydro boost system or I need to create a vacuum. And so some diesels may use a vacuum pump that is ran as an accessory off of the engine in order to use a vacuum booster, or they'll just do a straight hydro boost system. Now, a system that I don't have shown up here right now is um, more of an electronic boost type system. BMW in their X7, I believe is utilizing, I don't know if they're using it in the X5, but I can tell you for sure they're using it in the new X7. Um, they're like sort of larger SUV. When you press on the brakes, it actually has a pressure sensor and it is determining how much brake you want. Um, it actually utilizes an electric motor to put additional hydraulic pressure in the system. Um, and if everything fails, it has a fail safe to where it closes valves and you still have your base hydraulic system and it'll actually utilize your electronic parking brake to help assist in braking so you almost can't even tell when it's not working properly. It's a really, really cool system. It's very hard to find any pictures or information on. I was lucky enough last summer to go to a BMW training at their facility. They invite us from time to time to get updates for instructors. Um, so we can pass down this knowledge to you guys. But for the moment, getting pictures of this, uh, of this technology is sort of tough. Um, we'll see when things start to sort of open up a little bit better. And we'll talk a little bit more about this when we get into a break class. Hydraulic system, um, I kind of showed you a picture at the beginning of all of this, um, and I think I'll probably talk about this and then we'll start into another video here. Um, our hydraulic system, well, we'll talk about this and then master cylinders because we have to talk about master cylinders. <laughs> With hydraulics, it's uh, pretty much peas and carrots. So, our hydraulic system itself, this is a little bit more of a detailed picture than the one I showed you at the beginning of the video. So here's our brake pedal again. This one includes our booster. So here's our push rod. Here is our vacuum booster. And over here, we've got our master cylinder. Again, I'll talk more about that in the next slide. Essentially, all you need to know is that we're creating a pressure. Let me see if I can actually write on here. Um, that would be really cool. And let's see if I can get a thickness going on here. It doesn't really want to let me. Um, let's try to highlight in red. Um, 
Okay, that's as thick as we'll get it. So we're building up a pressure in here and in here, whoop, all the way to here. Then we hit a break warning light switch. I'm gonna talk about that uh, more in depth in a break class, but it, what it essentially is, is a pressure differential switch. Um, we, it's a safety switch in here that is going to detect a drop in pressure. That's all we need to know right this moment. And this, uh, again, you may wanna make note, brake light warning switch is also known as a pressure differential switch. There's a little piston inside of here. We'll talk more about this in a few slides again. Um, but um, just in a nutshell, it is going to detect if I have a drop in my circuit in pressure, meaning I've got a massive brake leak, um, brake leak or brake hydraulic leak, and it will turn on your red brake warning light to let you know. I will tell you, you probably won't need the warning light to let you know you've got something wrong with your brakes because you're going to feel it in the pedal um, pretty instantly. Um, We've got a couple of valves here, something called a metering valve and a proportioning valve. That's going to be part of our brake balance system. We'll get into that in a few slides. And then that pressure is going to come out. And in this case, we've got pressure going to our front brake here. And we got pressure going to our rear brake here. That is our hydraulic system. And that pressure is going to either squeeze a brake rotor or it's going to push shoes out up against a brake drum. And this is going to be really hard for me because I don't have any actual drum with me to take off and show you guys at the moment um, because that's all at school. Um, and same with the rotors, but I'll do my best here. And I'm going to try to put in as much good videos as possible. Um, and down here separately, we see our parking brake. Here's our parking brake application. In this case, it's a pedal and a release lever and a cable that goes down to mechanically apply our rear parking brake. Um, so it is not a part of our hydraulic system. This is our hydraulic system, which is not super uh, complicated. So hopefully that makes sense. Now at the heart of our hydraulic system, if we go back here, at the heart of all of this is our master cylinder. That is what provides pressure in our system in order to get any force down at a wheel brake. So if we look at that master cylinder, as I mentioned, it's the heart of the hydraulic system. It is responsible for pumping fluid and fluid, what it doesn't say here is fluid pressure. That's, that's really the main gig here. Pumping fluid pressure down to the wheel assembly. So this is what it looks like in real life. I stole this off of the Google, um, which came off of QCarsPro.com, uh, QCarsPro.com. Here's our black vacuum booster. Here, down here in metal, is our master cylinder. So it's a round cylinder, a couple of pistons inside, funky looking pistons, and you can see going to our brakes, our brake fluid line. And then this big piece up here is a brake fluid reservoir. So if you're sitting at home and you're chilling, you don't have anything better to do, after you're done with this lecture, I would like for you to, whoever's car is at home, mom, dad, brother, sister, or roommate, if they're cool about it, or your own, pop the hood and take, if, if you're not familiar, take a look at your, your master cylinder. There's a, gonna be a brake fluid cap. If it is an older car, you may have a cast iron uh, brake fluid reservoir, and so you are gonna need, um, sometimes you may need a screwdriver to get the levers off to pull the cap off. But most modern brake fluid reservoirs are gonna be plastic in nature, and so you can sort of see through them. Check the level. There's usually a max and a minimum line. And then um, pop open that lid and check out your fluid. Um, we're going to talk about fluid here in a few slides. But just get yourself acquainted. As we're talking about this stuff, it's not a bad idea to sort of dive in and take a look at some stuff. Get your, get your hands dirty, because that's what we'd be doing if we were in school. Um, in person, anyways. Now, one thing I want to mention here, I'm going to get out of screen share before I talk about this. I want to talk about dual piston master cylinders and why they're even a thing, um, because there is always some confusion about that. And uh, I'm, I'm going to draw a very basic, but an older design actually. So we'll say um, here is our pedal, right? Here is our master cylinder. Oops, that's a tiny master cylinder. Um, Here's our master cylinder, that's fluid, right? 
coming off of this master cylinder, I'm sorry, I should have drew one. When you press on that pedal, you move a piston, and it's going to move fluid out of this chamber to our front wheel and our rear wheel. And so we know we're looking at a vehicle here. Here's our front tires. Here are our rear tires. Okay. This is a conventional old style single um, master cylinder. Everything pre 67 um, may look like this. If it hasn't been converted yet. Um, anybody see a problem with this? You're sitting at home. It makes sense. We build up pressure in our hydraulic system here. I'll, I'll sort of. Um, to make this easier to understand. We got fluid inside of here, right? And when you press on this pedal, again, we took out our power brakes here. We press on this pedal, we move this piston, and we create a fluid pressure in here. Fluid is then going to travel down, build pressure, and this is filled with fluid all the time, so fluid doesn't have to really travel. But I create a pressure inside the system by making the volume smaller. So we're trying to compress fluid. You can't compress fluid, so something's going to give, and we're going to get movement down at our brake system. Makes sense, right? Anybody knows the problem, though? How about if I spring a leak anywhere, here, 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 I lose hydraulic pressure, meaning pressure is going to come out there rather than apply my wheel brakes anywhere. So if I spring a leak anywhere in my brake system, in a single design, um, single piston master cylinder, you're screwed. You have no brakes, and hopefully your parking brake works because you don't you don't have anything. This is a dangerous design, which is why in 1967 they mandated um, a dual. They didn't mandate the dual piston master cylinder, but FMBSS did mandate that there had to be a secondary system in case something happened. And so here's what we did. Um, we sell our vehicles. We're gonna do. We're gonna get a new master cylinder here. Um, here's our new master cylinder. A fluid reservoir. Um, instead, we added two pistons. And I'm not. I'm not gonna draw it because I've got a better picture. Um, I'll pull up here. But when you press on that brake pedal, you're creating pressure that are coming out of two holes instead of one. There's two pistons and two chambers inside of the master cylinder instead of one. And what we started with was what we call a conventional system. So pressure would build up, let's say, here in that chamber and apply the rear brake. And that would move another piston inside of here that would apply pressure in here to our front brake. Well, that makes sense. Now, if I spring a leak back here, I still have front brakes. If I spring a leak up here, I still have my rear brakes. This is called a conventional system um, or a conventional split system where we split our front versus the rear. This is not a bad design. There's still vehicles sort of sprinkled about that utilize the conventional design, um, but a lot of vehicles went away from this. And here is why. Um, just one of the main downfalls is that if, for whatever reason, I did spring a leak in my front brake, that's a problem because most of my braking, and I'm just going to throw some numbers up here because the book talks about it, but um, it's in the ballpark. Normally, around 70 to 80 percent of your braking is done up front, while the 20 to, remainder 20 to 30 is done in the rear. Well, if I spring a leak in my front, I lose 70 percent of my brake which leaves me 30% essentially of my braking capability because of weight transfer and all that stuff. So some manufacturers found ways around this issue, but for the most part, most manufacturers went away for, from a conventional split system. And what they did was this. So since we have most of our braking done up front, we don't want to lose all of our front brakes in any situation. What they did was they went to what we call a split diagonal or diagonal split system. So one 
chamber of the master cylinder fed the right left and the left rear. While the other chamber provided pressure to the front six, so that was the front right, provided to the front left and the right rear. The nice part about this type of system is if I spring a leak in one of them, I only lose one of my front wheels um, in either one, right? So if I lose this one, then I only lose this wheel and this wheel. If I lose my green circuit, then I lose my, uh, my right front wheel and my left rear wheel. So no matter what, I still have one front wheel doing braking. Obviously, you're gonna have issues with pulling and things like that, but at least you're gonna have one front tire that's doing some braking, and that'll definitely help out a ton. And so a lot of vehicle manufacturers went to this style of system because of that reason. So let's catch up back here and talk about that a little bit more in depth. Um, so as I mentioned, dual piston master cylinders were mandated in 1967 from the FMBSS and it's to allow partial braking operation in case of some sort of hydraulic failure. So let's look at our master cylinder here. Here's that push rod that you apply as the driver. We've got a, I'm not going to get too into the internals um, because I, I do this in a brakes class. So just briefly, I've got one piston, we call it primary, and we've got a secondary over here. Notice we've got sort of these hangs that hang off the end of our pistons. That's in case of a hydraulic failure, they are able to bottom out and still apply the other piston. Um, so just in case you were wondering why they look like really strange pistons. And then these pistons have rubber seals on them to separate the chambers and to also keep fluid from leaking places that it shouldn't. I'm not gonna get into the ports right now, but they're going to allow fluid back and forth from our reservoir. Um, so this is exactly what I just mentioned. I just felt like it was easier to explain with my drawing. Um, it, right here, it's showing um, conventional typing on a rear wheel drive vehicle. This does happen a lot. Um, it does happen, for a number of reasons, BMW kept conventional piping or, or conventional type circuit for a long time. They are rear wheel drive vehicles. The weight is a little bit more evenly distributed because of that. And so they're able to do some of those things. Um, with a diagonal split, a lot of your front wheel drive vehicles uh, went to diagonal split a long time ago, especially pretty much like, a lot, like all your unibody vehicles like that, that are front wheel drive, they're essentially going to all be diagonal split. Um, I, I think even BMW may have just recently converted uh, to diagonal split as well, but they held conventional for a really long time. A lot of your trucks are conventional, um, but that has to do with um, weight in the bed and, and things like that. We'll get into it in the brakes class, but that is your hydraulic system in a nutshell. Um, let's go ahead and stop here to, uh, I'm gonna switch this to the next video. So um, again, bite-sized pieces, right? So.